Hello, everybody, and welcome back to our second podcast by The Learning Project. We are going to be talking about little ones that are dealing with some difficult issues. Um, we're going to be going through this series um, throughout um, our podcast. It's called Big Problems, Little People. And I would like to just introduce our expert on the area that we're going to be focusing on today, which is homelessness. Um, her name is Stephanie Nobles Beans. She's absolutely amazing. And also she is related to me. She's my mother. So I just think she's absolutely amazing. And I'm so excited about her being here today and really breaking down this, um, this, 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 this topic of homelessness. Like, What's going on? How does this all work? What can we do about it? And I chose to have her on our podcast because she had a um, homeless shelter for women and children for such a long time. And I know there's so many of you guys that are interested in maybe starting a homeless shelter or something very similar. Um, Stephanie is going to be doing a um, actual training, a workshop coming up here this year. Um, and it's going to be awesome. You guys, um, if you're interested in learning about how to build a homeless shelter, um, or even some type of resource center, I think she does a great job with that. And she had one for quite a long time. So, um, without further ado, Stephanie, welcome to the learning project. How are you doing today? I am doing fantastic. Thank you for inviting me. <laughs> Thank you. Project. Thank you so much for just being here. I appreciate it. Um, we are going to dive into the next part of our podcast. We are going to be looking at um, the effects of homelessness on a child. Um, I want to make sure that we understand that this is not a topic to be taken light lightly. Um, I think it's something that we really need to talk more about, but I think a lot of people are very uncomfortable talking about it. And so we're going to be talking about it in some general ways, but we're also going to dig deep as well. So um, I want to focus on a um, fact sheet that I actually pulled up for Washington State, and this actually is focusing on 2019. Um, and it says that children in poverty in the U.S., it ranges, um, or actually, let me go to straight to Washington State, because um, I think that way, because I kind of touched about it, touched on it um, in our last podcast series. But in Washington State alone, there's 232,000 children in poverty. That is huge. So the United States overall, we have about 22% of the kids that um, are actually in poverty. Um, and that was a statistic in 2010. But in 2017, they redid this, um, this, this um, statistic, and it actually uh, went down to 18%. So we're doing something as a collective whole. And that's what we want. We want our community members to be proactive in this area. Um, in Washington State, um, it actually went from 18% um, in 2000, um, to, yeah, in 2000, and then in 2007, it went down to 14%. I mean, how awesome would it be for us to get to 0%? Like, that would be amazing to be able to say, you know what, every single child um, has a safe and healthy home to go to, and they are secured. Um, so, um, Stephanie, tell me a little bit about, now we talked, we talked about the, the house in itself, but, um, tell me a little bit about some of the little ones that came to your facility and what were some of the challenges that you saw? Um, and I do want to let everybody know, we're not going to be using, um, people's real names to protect their identity, but we want to give you real practical things that you may see in your classrooms or if you run a shelter or you're thinking about running a shelter some things that you may see well you know when you think of homelessness it causes childhood trauma hmm. and when I think about some of the children that came to our transition home because I don't like to say shelters I always mm -hmm. say transition home because we want to make it a home while they're there mm -hmm. but some of the things that affect the children when they came there was a loss of community mm -hmm. uh, their possessions their routines privacy uh, and even when women were in domestic violence situations the security of uh, having uh, 
they were highly stressful because they felt unsafe. Yeah. And one of those things, it led to anxiety and depression, mm -hmm. withdrawal. And even some of our little ones were very aggressive. Mm -hmm. uh, we had one child that was staying with us. Um, he, uh, they were probably about six or seven. And um, the, the feeling of not having enough to eat, mm -hmm. uh, they put yeah. canned goods under their beds. Yeah. And I simply asked them the question, baby, why are you putting canned goods under your bed? And they simply said, well, just in case we have to leave. And if my mom messes up, I'm going to make sure that I have food in my backpack. Wow. That's so amazing. things like that, uh, or they were worried about something bad was going to happen to their family if, yeah. if the person that had been exposed to the domestic violence, that the person that hurt them would find them. Yeah. So. There are a lot of emotional and physical responses that children uh, were exposed to. And, mm -hmm. you know, violence in our community, it, even though the statistics are still low, yeah. I tell people one person being abused is still too much. Yeah, they exactly. To eliminate that. And so exactly. uh, what we did is we got mothers, especially those who had come out of prison and uh, really had not been connected to their children for a while. We made sure that they got into parenting classes. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, there was a, a, a program called Arms Abuse Recovery Ministry Services. Yeah. Women would come that had been victims themselves, but now they were overcomers and they had been trained to uh, show women how to first and foremost to love themselves and to help them show that you have been forgiven and that there is a way to love your children again, how to gain mm -hmm. trust again. Mm -hmm. And then for our children, we tried to connect them, not tried, but we connected them to resources because some of our kids were CPS. Mm -hmm. uh, and so we had uh, CPS workers come into the home, making sure that the home was safe, mm -hmm. making that parents were not neglecting their responsibilities of their children. Yeah. And so we know that when children are exposed to adversity and trauma, that they have a high risk of developing health and social and economic outcomes mm -hmm. in their lives. And so we wanted to make sure that mama was on point, mm -hmm. uh, making them feel good about themselves. We had a dress for success closet awesome. where they could go in and dress for success, I myself am, am an expert in writing uh, resumes and uh, cover letters. And so they were able to feel uh, that they were successful. Yeah. One of the things that was a blessing to our home is that if the women finished the program, we had about five cars donated to Fields of Diamonds. And the woman that would finish the program uh, would get a car. That's so awesome. Um, tell me, tell me a little bit about um, how long can they stay in the home with you? Because I thought this was pretty interesting. Um, typically, most, um, most, um, I would say, um, transitional homes, um, you could only stay there for six months, three months. Um, how long were the late women able to stay at your home? They were able to stay a year. Wow, that's awesome. As long as they stayed in the program followed the, 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 the principles and the regulations of the house. Uh, the, and, we, and, and like I said, out of the 28 women, uh, basically most of them almost completed the program. We had a few that were there for a few weeks, <laughs> yeah. a few months. But for those who really committed to the program because they came to the realization that it was not only about them, but their number one priority was developing a better life for their children. Absolutely. So, uh, it, was, it was a great program. I, sometimes I really miss it, but I was like, there are other uh, transition homes that I know that are evolving in our community. And so mm -hmm. when I find out how I can be a part as a volunteer, just to give some, some information on yeah. how to run a transition home, I try to make myself readily available for that. 
Absolutely. I want to touch on something that you said, which was your little one that was like storing food just in case something happened. Um, we want to tap into psychology right now, you guys. So I want us to look at Maslow's hierarchy of needs. I don't know if anyone knows of this, but if you don't, I want you to look it up. Um, and if you're in the class, you're actually going to be able to see a document, um, read through it and actually answer some questions that are going to help you re like really think about um, children's needs. So Maslow um, basically came up with this um, motivational theory in psychology and, and basically said that there is five tiers and children need certain things in order to um, be successful individuals um, and to really um, succeed in, in, in their community. So he looked at the psychological, he looked at safety, he looked at um, how they're being loved, being belo belonging, uh, self-esteem, um, and all of that good stuff. So um, the first level of Maslow's hierarchy of needs is focused on the psychology needs. So it, or the psychological needs, excuse me, I think I said psychology, but psychological needs. So um, psychological meaning food, water, warmth, rest. That's your basic need. Um, the second um, level is the safety needs, so security um, and feeling safe. Um, the next level is the belonging and love, so that partnership, that, um, that connection, the friendship um, to either their, their family or people around them, their community, um, the esteem. So this is looking at um, feeling accomplished, like do they feel proud of themselves? Are they um, are they able to look at themselves and and be proud of the things that they do and are who they're becoming? And then actual um, self actualization. So this is achieving one's full potential, including creativity, um, different actions, things like that. So it's that self fulfillment. Um, tell me a little bit, you, you just really talked about the psychological needs. Tell me a little bit about how homes like yours created a safe environment and how were you able to partner with the uh, families to help them in, engulf that? Well, you know, once they get into the program, uh, the first 30 days is a settling because they have been out of sorts for so long. Yeah. Is mm -hmm. trying to get them to understand number one that they are in a safe place. Uh, confidentiality was of the utmost, not only with my staff but with the uh, the residents that resided there too. They could not let other people know that they were living there when they were there. There was no boyfriends or uh, outside relationships. Mm -hmm. The key factor was on them and what they needed to do to strengthen their abilities to be productive parents again. And so they, like I said, they had a, a the first 30 days was a settling. Um, once they, and they had uh, uh, 30 days, you know, that it's a blackout. You don't get to really do anything. We don't take your phones or anything, but you are obligated to get up in the morning, make up your bed, to do a routine. Yeah. And we see if they could follow that routine for 30 days. And believe it or not, some women, refused to follow that routine they thought it was too much yeah and, and you know if you can't do something and make it a habit for 30 days mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. in the program uh, one particular young lady uh would get up in the morning and she would never make up her bed mm -hmm. so the first five days is observation we're looking to see if you're going to clean your room make up your bed just do the the regular uh things that you would do every morning absolutely and, one morning I just asked her, why don't you make up your bed? And she looked at me with tears in her eyes because she was about 19 going on 20 and she was having her first baby. She said, my mother never taught me how to make up a bed. Mm. I said, why is that? She said, she's in prison for 25 years. Mm. So, uh, and we never had discussed her mom. I wasn't one of those type of people to push. So when we would have our one-on-ones, I would say, when you're ready to disclose to me about your background, mm -hmm. you're more than, you know, more than willing to share. And so yeah. the last day she gained my uh, trust. And so when I showed her how to make up a bed, Believe it or not, she was so excited about making up a bed. She'd always make up her bed and it would just be like perfect. She didn't want anybody sitting yeah. on her bed. <laughs> you know, it's just those little bitty things. Uh, yeah. The second thing is 
not only teaching them how to clean their room, make up their beds, but also to find out what they would like to do. Do you want to go back to school? So we were connected to SCC, SFCC. Mm -hmm. uh, if they wanted to get a, a trade, we would try to find something where they could, you know, go to a trade school. Yeah. Um, the, the third thing was making sure that they were healthy. What, what is it that do you need anything? Or is it something that we need to do for you and your children? So it was just mm -hmm. little key components to give them stability in yeah. the home. And so yeah. the first three months, amazing. Some women made great strides. And then about that six month, they thought, okay, I've been here six months. I'm ready to go. I'm getting out. And they weren't ready. Yeah. 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 <laughs> so you know, I'm telling them, okay, how, do you have your housing? Uh, is case management working with you? Uh, we try to find your employment assistance and legal services while they were in the home. Yeah, Some of yeah. them were like sponges. Whatever they needed, they like, what do I need to do? Mm -hmm. Simple thing, women had not lived in Spokane a long time. How do I catch the bus? How yeah. do I make sure that my kids get to school? Uh, even the mere fact of doing laundry, folding clothes, making sure that your kids are clean, Going to school, that was one of my, I, I was like, when you send these children out, you're not only representing yourself, but you're representing Fields of Diamonds, House of Blessings. Yes, and yes. so when people found out, oh my goodness, you know, this is a home where we would, that I would have so many people on the waiting list. We would have to turn people down because we could only do yeah. uh, one, two, four women at a time. Yeah. Yeah. And up to six children at a time. And I think you said something really key here. I don't want you guys to miss this. So everything that she's talking about is exactly what Maslow is talking about, which is looking at those psychological needs. How do you help teach them how to provide those things for their kids if they've never done that? How do you help them provide an environment that is safe? What does that look like? How do they do that? Those are all the key pieces um, to just meet those basic needs for a lot of kids that may be in a homeless situation. Um, a lot of kids, I remember even just starting, you know, when I started doing a lot of the educational pieces there, I remember kids would really be standoffish or they would be completely out of control. Like their emotions were just all over the place. And I think one of the things that you have to remember as an educator is if you're not asking the right questions to families, you will not know that someone is in need of something or um, that child may struggle with certain things because of the situation that they're in currently. And so if you are this is like a really good example just even for me as an educator I've walked into situations and I've addressed things a certain way but then when I actually realize like oh this child can't do this or this child ha has been dealing with this then I'm like oh my goodness why didn't I ask before I started just making a pathway or making an action for a child and so it's really hard but you have to take that extra time to talk with families and then also to create a plan with um, other educators and that child because they are going to be going through a lot of different things and they may not feel that security and that trust and that love and they may be feeling a lot of different emotions and you have to be prepared for that as an educator um, because it can be very difficult when you're dealing with a little one um, who is struggling due to their home life. Um, and, and one of the things that I'm worried about in our community, um, that programs will not be cut and services will not be cut because those programs and services that are here in Spokane, they help strengthen the family. Yes. They resiliency. They protect families from circumstances and conditions which can put them at risk and, 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 to, and can be effective. So one of the things that my heart and, and I'm trying to get back into community is to make sure that there are programs that if I find out that I can relay those to other people, because if we teach skills that promote positive child parent relationships, mm -hmm. we can reduce the rates of abuse and neglect because yes. they will have resources, they will have programs that will prevent and even reduce uh, childhood exposure. And, yes. and, and I always like the African pro uh, proverb that says, you teach one or you reach one to teach one. Yes. Because if you can teach one about 
how to end homelessness in their a current situation, they can break that generation cycle of homelessness and break that cycle of abuse. And that's why in our home, we were trying to show, and not just trying, but we did, is that this is what you can do so that your child will not be exposed or be an abuser themselves. Absolutely. Um, programs and support families, it's strengthens and gives healthy children yes oh my goodness you you said something so key there mom um you know there's so many big problems and these little people who are trying to figure out how does the world work um they need to know that their community is is actually around them and they are um championing for them and they're active in the community um, one of the areas that I've always been really curious about, um, just in the, the, the couple, last couple of weeks as I've been putting this program together, is, you know, we've talked a lot about homeless um, women that have children, but there's a flip side of homeless fathers that have children, and really there's nowhere for them to go. Um, they, uh, a statistic shows that an astonishing 73% of families will be turned away from from shelters and they're forced to separate from their children due to the different structures in the um the shelters there is a website i want to give them a shout out it's called invisible people and um there is a great article called where do homeless single fathers go and i think in our area we need more um, shelters that cater to homeless fathers one of the things that was mentioned into um, this um, this article was talking about how families would start to become homeless because of illness because of death um, a lot of people are one paycheck away from being homeless so if your spouse that has a two parent or two income household um, passes away or they become ill you instantly go into poverty and you instantly have situations that are going to take place that are going to negatively impact um, your child and your family and, and different things like that um, it's really hard um, to forget, like, you know, um, forget that there are homeless fathers out there that really need somewhere to go. Um, and they're forced to give up their children because they don't, they're the wrong gender. I hate to say it like that, but basically you're the wrong gender. So you don't get a, you don't get to be in a shelter. Um, speak a little bit about that. Cause I know you and I have talked about that before, mom. Um, what are your thoughts and what are some things that you feel need to be done um, to help support children to stay with their their father if their mother is absent well we look at yeah we look at it like this homeless families are just that they're still family mm -hmm. and fathers love their children and so i think in our community there needs to be a courageous conversations about how do we help homeless fathers mm -hmm. be reestablished without giving up their children because they don't have a place mm -hmm. uh, where their children and a father can go, yeah. uh, especially when there is a father and a female yes. child. Yes. Uh, it's hard to be uh, in, a, in a place because they could be exposed to so many things. Mm -hmm. And so I'm hoping that uh, someone would step to the plate and say, you know what? We have a transition home specifically for fathers yeah. and their children. And it would be run on the same premises as it would be run for a, a transition home for women and children. Mm -hmm. Because mm -hmm. like I said, they still need the resources. They still need the help. Absolutely. They still need to make sure that they're in parenting classes. The same thing that women with children need, so do fathers with children need mm. experience homelessness and it's um i don't know statistically how big it is in spokane yeah. but it yeah. still exists that yeah. it still is yeah so we need to, to to maybe uh talk about and maybe look statistically in the future about how many uh fathers or statistically how many fathers are in this community that don't have a place. They are either yeah. couch surfing or they've had to give their child mm -hmm. to a family member mm -hmm. while they try to get on their feet. And that's mm -hmm. that separation anxiety 
-hmm. that children will have. Again, I'm being taken away from my mom or I'm being taken away from my father because I can't be with them because we don't have a place to be. And Absolutely. so that's something that, we, yeah. Uh, and I think, you know, I've heard children say, you know, we have no place to live. Uh, mm -hmm. What if something bad happens to my family or my dad because I'm not with him? And so, yeah, yeah it's a conversation that really needs to take place. Yeah. And what you just described is absolute mental torture for a child. You know, um, there's a couple of kiddos that I've worked with and they've had to go on visits to see their families and things like that. Um, and, you know, they have been separated from their family, dealt with homelessness, and then they go to the visits and then they come back to like a learning center and then they're around all these kids that are talking to them and doing all this stuff. I'm like, that's a lot for a child to have to like actually process. I mean, even the mental health, um, um, situation that happens within a family member's head, you know, a mother, a father, or um, the next group of people that are really stepping up or had to step up is actually grandparents as well. You know, there's so many grandparents that are raising their children because, you know, the mother and father have left or they're not stable or they're dealing with mental health issues. Um, there's so many pieces that go into this um, when we're talking about looking at the signs of. Um, homelessness and how they negatively impact every part of our community. Um, mm -hmm. I, I've heard that during the early years, brain connections, they determine how children learn and yes. think, grow and are formed. And it makes young children who experience trauma particularly vulnerable mm. because I, I, when some of the babies that lived with us who had experienced trauma, there was an increase of sickness, mm -hmm. uh, development delays, they have mental health issues. Yes. Those are to adults, including anxiety and depression, chronic health conditions. Uh, some of our babies, one of our babies even had asthma because they had been exposed to trauma and, mm -hmm. and that the trauma triggered the asthma. So mm -hmm. they're exposed to so many things, so many things. And, and, and you know, I, I was reading statistically where it said the National Center for Homeless Education, it said more than 20% of homeless children ages three to six. Now we're talking three to six year old mm -hmm. require mental health care for emotional wow. issues. Wow. Uh, wow. Three to six years old. Wow. And then it, mental health issues are even more pervasive for school age children. And it's, an, it's estimated that 24 to 40% of elementary age children experiencing homelessness have some form of mental issues that will necessitate professional evaluation. And oh that is according to the National Center for Homeless and Education. Mm -hmm. Then it goes on mm -hmm. to tell us that the rate is two to four times higher than the rate for children living in poverty in wow. this age. So wow. the mental issues among homeless population continues to increase at, at this children's age. And it's scary that you're talking three to six year olds who require some type of mental health care. Wow. And, yeah. and I, I t this is like where I stand on my soapbox every single time. Early childhood education is such a prominent area. And I think a lot of times, and I want to make it very clear, clear I'm not against any any organization or establishment or anything like that. But the same resources that are available for public school, they need to be available for private school. And I think one of the conversations that we're not having is that every child learns differently. Every child needs something different. And whatever way a child is going to be educated, those resources that are out there should be available. One of the things I always said is that, you know, we should be able to have access mental health counselors for our little ones because we can see when they are literally mentally in turmoil because of the things that they're going through and we can't even help them because we don't have the right resources or we can't get the resources or we can't afford the resources and yeah. so unless you're a part of a um, larger organization that is a tied to like ecap or head start which i think they do an amazing job but there's also a lot of centers out here that are doing amazing jobs too and they have some great teachers and we need to embrace that and so i think really us 
taking the opportunity to look at laws and policies and things that are happening in our community and vote on that. Don't just wait for it to happen. Make movement um, and take take action, you know? Um, I think that has been a reoccurring theme when we're talking today about what can we do? How do these things work? But the more we know, the more we are going to be empowered to make effective change. And it's more than just giving a child some shoes or clothes or food. It's about how do we heal the whole family, regardless of if it's a single father, single mother, two parent home, or any of that. I think that's just really important. I want to thank you guys so much for this, uh, taking the time to listen to this segment. Um, we have one more segment that we're going to be doing. Um, I hope you join us. This is an amazing um, series that we're doing right now. Big problems, little people. I want to thank you again for this, for you just taking the time to listen, you guys. Don't just take this information and just let it go through one ear and out the other. Do something about it. Be a person that makes action. Be a person that makes change in our community. And don't be afraid of the unknown. I want to thank you so much for taking the time out to listen to our second podcast, Big Problems, Little People. Join us for our next podcast where we will be discussing how can we make effective change in the three different levels of coaching with families children, and each other. Thank you so much and have a great day. Thank you for listening.